Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as a physician, philosopher, yogi. He's a passionate interest in Aurobindo and the rich tradition of India's holistic healing systems. He's the product of India's premier medical institute, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where he was a professor and head of department of the Department of Physiology. Uh, he's published more than uh, 200 research papers, nearly 10 books and several articles in the popular press explaining his ideas and philosophy and in some senses bringing together a fusion, a synthesis where one tradition helps reinforce an understanding of the other traditions. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ramesh Bijlani. Thank you. Um, you had a, 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 a distinguished career in India's premier medical institution uh, in, in mainstream medicine. What were the dissatisfactions or, or the incompleteness or the inadequacies of it uh, that prompted uh, your interest uh, in looking at, at, at yoga and meditation and, and, and other systems? And, uh, you know, it's a chicken and the egg. What preceded it? You know, was it sort of your personal interest, say, in Aurobindo that drew your attention to this? What happened? Well, I must uh, say that I would say that uh, it was not a dissatisfaction with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences or with scientific medicine in particular. Uh, it is uh, just that uh, science in general has uh, gone through a bit of a humbling experience during the last 50 to 100 years. And uh, the result of this has been rather positive. Science has started stretching itself. What we call science itself has been undergoing some change. Uh, coming more specifically to what uh, drew me towards it, uh, I had been interested in uh, religion and spirituality for a very long time, but uh, it was some personal crisis in my life that uh, took me to Sri Ashram in 1992. And it was then that uh, for the first time I understood that uh, yoga was more than just a set of physical asanas, which I had been doing for more than 20 years before that, and uh, that uh, uh, I could fit in the techniques of yoga into the philosophy of yoga that I could do for the first time after I went there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, it was during the same period that uh, I noticed that uh, the area of uh, nutritional physiology and nutrition in relation to cardiovascular disease and diabetes that I had been working on for uh, more than 20 years then, uh, I realized that uh, uh, that field had also been changing a bit. Uh, we had started realizing that nutrition was just one part of lifestyle as a whole. And uh, unless we pay attention to the entire lifestyle, uh, paying attention to uh, one factor at a time uh, was not the best approach. And, uh, and the West itself was looking at uh, uh, better lifestyles and uh, in that process had rediscovered yoga. Mm -hmm. And that's how my personal and professional life started converging. Let's look at this thing that you mentioned, uh, this, this point you made about uh, the techniques and the philosophy of yoga and, 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 and your experience of their, their merging and, 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 and mutually supporting each other in a sense. That, uh, and, and, you know, I think you also mentioned that uh, how uh, you, you, you felt that uh, yoga was not just the, the practice of asanas. Um, you know, there is a phrase that's often used called sort of spiritual materialism. Which, uh, which implies that very often we look at uh, spirituality and the spiritual traditions in a very utilitarian way. That if I do X, I will get a result Y. So if I do, do a lifestyle change, uh, not necessarily make me uh, you know, a better, uh, happier human being, but might uh, you know, enable me to do what I do um, in, you know, as a manager and, 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 and doing sort of counterproductive things, but to do it better. Uh, how have you been able to look at this interface? And then I, I could just go back to this issue of, of the philosophy and the technique and, and, and the marriage of them. What is the result? What is the output, in a sense, that uh, a spiritual aspirant who is also uh, a physician seeks? Well, the way I have been looking at it is uh, that uh, 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 health or uh, restoration of health is uh, an excuse which uh, uh, brings patients to yoga. 
and uh, certainly I mean to get more from it is up to them, entirely up to them. Uh, things like uh, physical fitness or uh, improvement of performance in the examination for students or uh, in increasing the productivity of factory, these are things which uh, can be done uh, through methods other than yoga as well. Uh, what distinguishes yoga from all these other things is that in yoga that is not the primary goal. All these things do happen in yoga but they are just side effects or fringe benefits. They are not the primary goal of yoga. And uh, the only reason why we have techniques which uh, seem to be somewhat unique to yoga is that in yoga the aim is nothing short of perfection. And perfection from, for the sake of perfection. And since the journey from the point where we are to the point of perfection is uh, a very long journey for any of us. We try to use the best available techniques. No, when we have a very long journey uh, ahead of us, then one of the things we try to do is to find a shortcut. Unfortunately, there is no shortcut in yoga because the distance between the point where we are and perfection cannot be reduced. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is that we can hasten our pace and uh, that we can do by using the best available technology. And uh, that's why over uh, a long period of time, thousands of years, uh, uh, many traditions, sometimes independently, have stumbled upon very similar techniques for uh, uh, covering that distance in the shortest possible time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how the techniques fit into yoga. And then while we do that, long before we reach the destination in yoga, the destination of perfection, we find that we get much healthier, we start feeling happier, and uh, everything in the worldly, worldly sphere also starts looking up. So what is this, this perfection that uh, yoga seeks and, 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 and aspires to? Uh, perfection in all aspects of the being. And when we say all aspects of the being, it includes not only the body, the mind and the intellect, but also his divine essence. In other words, what uh, the goal is to uh, bring about a transformation in the body, the mind and the intellect in such a way that they all start working in the light of the divine essence within. And uh, when they are able to do that completely and perfectly, that would be the point of perfection. Is a secular yoga therefore possible, excluding notions of the divine or a specific notion of the divine? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, yoga can be practiced without uh, uh, believing in, even without even believing in God. Uh, but then uh, uh, most of us do believe that uh, perfection is something which is uh, not uh, possible for human beings. Human beings by very defini by definition are imperfect and therefore the point of perfection uh, becomes uh, some sort of an identity or union with God. And that's how God enters yoga. At least that's one way, one important way in which God enters yoga. Mm -hmm. Another uh, handicap which a person who does not believe in God would be and that uh, we cannot depend entirely on our own efforts to reach the destination in yoga. Mm -hmm. We need, in addition to our own efforts, also divine grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another important point at which mm -hmm. God enters So for, for you, as, as, as uh, a student of uh, Aurobindo, uh, what is the, this, this notion of the divine? Is it unique? Is it exclusive? Can that, uh, that vision or understanding or experience or perception or whatever uh, of the divine vary? Or is, is it uniquely to, and we'll just come to sort of, you know, the notion of uh, integral yoga uh, that Sri Aurobindo teaches. But what is this notion of the divine? Uh, in fact, the divine in the broadest uh, sense, and the divine that uh, resides within each one of us, that is, uh, uh, the individual self, the universal self, as well as the transcendental self. And uh, this is a concept of the divine which would be compatible with the spiritual philosophy underlying any religion. Mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, integral yoga? Uh, you know, as, as the phrase itself suggests, it's something that's, that's integrated, that brings in various elements of, uh, uh, of, of uh, human aspiration and, 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 and techniques. In, in, into one composite whole. What is integral yoga? Yes, as you said very rightly, integral is total. And uh, uh, the time when she, um, the uh, period during which Aurobindo was uh, looking at yoga uh, was one, you know, uh, in which uh, the different schools of yoga had become rather so rigid that uh, the form was given, being given much more importance than the spirit behind it. And uh, 
uh, what he did was to try to go to the spirit behind all the schools of yoga and discovered that in fact there was a lot in common and the spirit was one of uh, moving towards self-perfection. It was just that different schools were emphasizing different aspects of this perfection. For example, Hatha Yoga emphasizes physical perfection, Raja Yoga emphasizes mental perfection and Tantra Yoga was trying to emphasize that yoga can be practiced while being in the world without rejecting the world and so on. So what he did was that what we should do is to seize on the central principles of all the different schools of yoga, put them together and uh, then practice in such a way that uh, we are able to use the spirit of all of them without emphasizing the form. And the result was uh, integral yoga in which uh, we try to promote physical perfection, mental perfection as well as uh, emphasize the fact that uh, for practicing yoga we don't have to reject the world because if the divine is real, his manifestation which the world is, is also real and therefore the world has to be transformed and not to be rejected. So without uh, rejecting the world, without uh, uh, going through a process of physical renunciation, we try to bring yoga into everyday life. And in this, uh, Sri Aurobindo's yoga leans very heavily on the Gita, which also has emphasized the same thing, that we can practice yoga while being in the real world. And that is why Gita also emphasizes, you know, that um, unlike uh, some of the traditional schools in yoga, like Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga, where the emphasis is on the terminal point, mm -hmm. which is difficult for any of us to reach. And uh, whereas Gita, and therefore many people get put off that, uh, well, I'll never be able to achieve the top type of siddhis that Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga emphasize. And therefore probably yoga is meant only for a select few. But in the Gita, and the Lord himself has given an assurance that you can approach me through any of the routes that suit your inclinations and temperaments best, the route of action or knowledge or devotion. And uh, you don't have to go all the way. Every step that you take towards me will bring you a commensurate response. As a physician, your, uh, you know, your work and, and your striving has, has obviously been when you were looking at issues of diabetes, you're looking at hypertension or what have you, is looking at how specific uh, techniques and practices might be able to impact specific conditions even as the whole continues its process of transformation because the immediate crisis is probably cardiovascular or diabetes or what have you and, and perfection and I, I guess another word for perfection would be enlightenment or nirvana or whatever phrases you want to use I and mean, I don't know if that's a fair uh, analogy but I would assume that if, if, you're, if you're willing to allow different uh, traditions and different parts that you would also allow that. But what about these, these, these specific correlations? To what degree uh, has your work as a physician uh, and as a professor of physiology established these relationships? Is, is, is there a particular technique that impacts diabetes? Is there a particular technique that Im immediately in the short term impacts hypertension? Well, whether a person has hypertension or diabetes or bronchial asthma, uh, these diseases tend to be the physical manifestation of a deeper underlying distress. That is something which modern medicine is realizing more and more. Uh, although being rooted in the physical consciousness, we tend to attribute far greater importance to things like diet or lack of exercise or smoking. And uh, correspondingly, uh, we lay also uh, give greater credit to uh, these physical factors in the process of management also. But then we find that the mind-body relationship is, uh, is so dominant that uh, uh, that plays an important role in causing these diseases as well as can play a very important role in treatment. And therefore, when we started the patient care facility called Integral Health Clinic at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, we started use, using yoga primarily as a tool in mind-body medicine. That is, we were trying to influence the mind of the patient positively to achieve self-healing because uh, in these chronic degenerative diseases also, the capacity to heal resides within the body. The only thing is we have to give it a proper opportunity. And uh, in that, positive thinking plays a very important role. So are there specific mental states or mental conditions that manifest in specific diseases? I mean, is, 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 I mean at, at the broad level, uh, as a lay person, you hear of type A personality and type B personality and what have you. And if you have a particular type of personality, you're more predisposed to a particular uh, disease. Uh, but beyond that, are there sort of specifics that you then begin to address and use those specific techniques to, to impact the patient? Uh, no, the, uh, 
it's not that uh, a particular type of uh, mental stress would lead to a particular type of disorder. Uh, it's just that uh, the same type of uh, mental stress can give rise to different diseases in different individuals depending upon what their weak point is. And what the weak point is in our body is uh, determined largely by genetic factors. So the same stress uh, may give rise to hypertension in one person, diabetes in another, and a peptic ulcer in a third person, and a bronchial asthma in a fourth person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not trying to say that physical factors play, do not play any role at all. Uh, even in management, we were using physical uh, uh, techniques also. We were using asanas and pranayama. But uh, uh, they are not as specific as we sometimes tend to think. Mm -hmm. A general increase in physical activity, uh, some breathing exercises, uh, is able to achieve quite a bit of uh, non-specific improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. The f uh, specific practices advocated for uh, a particular disease uh, probably have uh, a less uh, significance than is generally attributed to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, modern science is now looking at uh, you know the biochemistry uh, of the brain and and, and 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 reducing emotions and and, and feelings and, and 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 many of these sort of subtle processes to pure biological processes of the brain and so now you have antidepressants and you have a whole range of drugs and treatments that say this is biological and you know we give you a drug and it's going to solve it and why spend you know years and decades uh, you know doing yoga and practices and, 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 and meditating and you know pop a pill what do you say to these people uh, there are a few uh, things which uh, make uh, the yogic techniques much better than uh, using the pill. One, of course, is the side effects of the pills. Second is the dependence on these pills. Uh, when the effect of the pill is over, you have to, the only thing you can do is to take another uh, pill. Uh, to some extent, uh, a similar mistake, uh, which was much more serious, was made uh, in the 60s. I mean, you know, we had this uh, generation of flower children and all. and. Uh, and uh, they were looking for uh, an alternative to the materialist life which they were disgusted with and did not know what the alternative could be and in this, that process took to drugs. And they realized that some of these drugs gave them uh, an experience which was bordering on the spiritual experiences which had some similarities with uh, what they discovered were the descriptions of spiritual experiences. Now, uh, did, give, did give them a high but then uh, it ruined their lives not only because of the side effects, because of the poverty which it brought them, uh, but uh, ultimately, I mean, what was uh, found was that uh, what these drugs do is to, again, uh, give rise to a neurochemistry which is similar to the one which is created during spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, duplicating the chemistry is not the same thing as having the experience. What distinguishes a person who gets, uh, uh, who go, tries to depend upon this uh, apparent shortcut of uh, using a chemical to duplicate the chemistry is that uh, as a person he does not in fact change. In fact, he becomes more self-centered, more selfish and uh, because uh, sometimes getting these drugs can cost a lot of money, uh, mm -hmm. he tries to get that money any which how, mm -hmm. which may turn him into a criminal. On the other hand, a person who has uh, arrived at a similar experience uh, through a slower but uh, a better route mm -hmm. of uh, trying to be on the spiritual path he in that process goes through a transformation which uh, induces in him a feeling of uh, universal love, universal unconditional love which does not expect anything in return. Mm -hmm. So it's the type of person that he becomes which is more important than uh, getting the experience. We've been looking at this uh, interface between um, mind and body and, and the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo and, and issues of yoga which are now broadly presented uh, you know, under the ambit of holistic medicine, mind-body relationship. What's come through to me is the underlying dimension and, and the need for sadhana, uh, that you know, there is no instant solution to contemporary physical, mental uh, ailments and predicaments. Uh, am I right in getting the sense that what you're also saying is that if you follow these general principles uh, of, uh, of, of, of spiritual aspirant, uh, that uh, the perfection of body and mind uh, is achievable uh, without it being specifically oriented 
to your particular condition. I think a criticism recently that you know, Mr. B.K. Sainagar made about Swami Ramdev and said, look, if you can sit there and teach this yoga to you know, 100,000 people, then my 75 years of experience is down the drain because each individual is unique and requires a specific, unique program or approach. Hence, perhaps the role of the guru, individual instruction and attention to meet individual needs. How does this manifest itself for you? How do you see this, uh, this debate, in a sense? Well, without going into the individual's concern, uh, what I would like to say is that, in general, teaching yoga on the television is uh, probably not the best way to teach it. Or, uh, and the reason being that um, uh, you have only a limited time in which you demonstrate a few techniques. So you tear the techniques out of context. The techniques do not fit into the entire philosophy of uh, yoga, firstly. Secondly, the techniques also, uh, the person uh, can give only a limited amount of instruction on the television. So anybody who is watching the television, he is mainly concentrating on the final pose. And he thinks that he somehow he has to achieve the final position. Now, how you get into that posture is also important. How slowly, with what type of a slow, gentle, graceful movement. And uh, if a person is not able to reach the final position, it's also important to know that uh, one doesn't have to force the body into that posture. One can move in that direction without uh, achieving the final pose. And it's only gradually as the flexibility of the body improves that one can approach the final pose. But what about this, this notion, this idea of the individual, of, mm. of an individualized approach? Uh, and isn't there a risk that, uh, you know, what was in a sense, you know, practice in the cloisters and has now been by some people made more democratic perhaps, uh, but was dependent on the relationship between the master and the pupil who individualized it for, 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 for the student. Uh, how significant uh, in, in a dimension is that? Uh, well, in that respect, what Sri Aurobindo says is that certainly the guru is very important, but the guru doesn't have to be a living guru. Because uh, the Guru has uh, primarily uh, three roles. One is uh, that of what he says. And uh, for that, the Guru doesn't have to be physically present. He can say it through his books, through what he has written. The second is through his example. And for that also, he doesn't really have to be living. Uh, you can see how he has lived his life, and that sets an example in front of us. And the third is the presence, that is, in fact, the most important. And uh, for that also, he doesn't have to be present because the uh, vibrations that he has set up can far outlast the Guru himself. But is it possible that the techniques and processes and approaches in your needs from spiritual practice to achieve perfection are different to mine? Exactly. Uh, Sri Aurobindo's yoga, for the same reason, is not a technique intensive yoga. No technique is specifically prescribed. And at the same time, no technique is specifically proscribed. And, uh, and the individuals can choose depending upon uh, their inclinations, temperament, how much time is available, and uh, what the limitations of each individual are. Um, uh, because broadly speaking, also, we do have uh, uh, limitations to many of the practices. For example, everybody cannot practice Kapalabhati. If a person has high blood pressure, probably he should avoid it. The same way, if a person has high blood pressure, uh, probably should be avoiding inverted postures. So mm -hmm. there are limitations. Mm -hmm. But then that does not prevent a person from preventing yoga, because yoga is far more than these techniques. Mm -hmm. If a person cannot do any of the asanas, even he can practice yoga. So for practice of yoga, really, uh, these physical limitations do not matter. In this, in this journey, uh, how important is, is a moral, ethical uh, framework? Uh, because in, in, in the logic of science, we're always looking at a very empirical causality and effect, you know, cause and effect. You do certain practice and something else happens. Uh, even in the yoga traditions, you say you must have yama, niyama, you must have a moral framework before the practice starts, lest it go awry. How important has, is, 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 you know, is the moral framework uh, for the kind of work, you know, that, that you do? Yes, Puritans tend to feel that uh, uh, using yoga, which is a, a discipline which was designed primarily for spiritual growth mm -hmm. and just for uh, restoring health, is a sort of a misuse. Mm -hmm. I think probably that's what uh, mm -hmm. you are hinting at. Mm -hmm. 
But there is also another way of looking at it that um, rarely does anyone turn to a spiritual discipline unless uh, uh, we have uh, either a worldly motive or we are in some difficulty. Mm -hmm. So, these are uh, turning points in our life, these are wake up calls and uh, ill health is, can be as good an excuse as any. As the Gita says, there are four types of devotees. Mm -hmm. The first is the Artha or the one who is miserable. Mm -hmm. The second is the Artharthi, that is who wants some mm -hmm. material gain. Mm -hmm. And the third is the Jigyasu, that is one who is inquisitive, mm -hmm. uh, wants to know what God is all about. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is the Jnani, who already knows the glory of God and uh, therefore is so enamored of Him that He gets completely devoted mm -hmm. to Him. He has realized the glory of God. Tell me that. But then uh, the first one is the most important, <laughs> the one who is miserable. Mm -hmm. Tell me that you, know, you spoke about this personal mm -hmm. crisis, turning point that uh, pointed you in this direction. Could you, in sort of layperson's uh, language, and I know that uh, th th these are sort of, in some senses, non-conceptual experiences and very difficult to describe, uh, but if you were to recommend the journey um, and, and the impact it has had on you, uh, to someone, say to me, uh, uh, what would you say that, you know, do this, pursue it, because it will bring what? Yes, sir. what I think it does, uh, what the most important result of this is that uh, you achieve a sense of peace. Uh, I would not describe it as happiness. In fact, happiness is too inadequate a word for it. Happiness is a part of dualities. If there's happiness, then sorrow will also be there. They come in pairs. And this is a sense of inner peace or a feeling for which we have to devise words like joy, delight and bliss. Do you experience this from your journey? Uh, well, at least uh, I I uh, wouldn't like to say much, but I mean, uh, one can have some glimpses of it. But this is a different type of feeling altogether. And the most important thing is that this feeling is independent of external circumstances. It's not dependent upon uh, whether things are going right in my life. It's not dependent upon what food I'm eating. It's not dependent upon how much I'm earning. It doesn't depend upon how much I'm wearing. Uh, it doesn't depend upon which car I'm driving. In short, I mean, it's completely independent of external circumstances, independent of all those things which we normally think are the sources of happiness or the objects in which happiness resides. One discovers it does not reside in any of them and one can have a sense of inner peace which is for which the resources are entirely within us. Dr. Bijlani, thank you very much. This has been a great blessing, honor and a learning experience. Thank, thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs>